Have you ever had one of your favorite activities completely ruined for you? Maybe forever. Due to a negative memory associated with it. I do. I don't think I'll ever be able to sleep outside of anything that remotely resembles a house again. After one night in late June of 2019. My boyfriend, Tim, and I had been together for about two and a half years. And actually met due to some mutual friends that like both of us. Who loved being outdoors. Hiking, biking, kayaking, camping, you name it, we'd do it, and probably have done it. Now, we're not really adverse to getting dirty or smelling horribly after spending days in the wilderness, but I would say that we try to avoid it if at all possible. For that reason, we decided, soon after moving in together, to buy a decent-sized RV trailer. He already drove a truck very useful for carrying outdoor gear or accessing remote-ish trails, so we invested a solid chunk of change in a 20-feet trailer. It was surprisingly pretty nice. I won't say it was the Ritz-Carlton of the camping trailer world, but it was better than sleeping on the ground with bugs and dirt and who knows what else. The back of it had a bathroom with a toilet, shower, and window. The middle had a kitchen and couch that folded into a bed, and the front had another bed. No frills, but it got the job done. Because of the size of RV beds, we typically would use both beds if it was just the two of us, but we could squeeze into front bed together if necessary or if we were in the mood. Starting in the spring of 2019, we took this thing all over the western half of the US. We both had jobs that allowed us to work remotely doing this before it was cool, so we had some pretty epic road trips for those first few months. Around Memorial Day, we wrapped up our trip and came home for a while. Though had plans to head to my parents' house for the 4th of July. We lived on the west coast, they lived back in the Midwest, so it'd entail a couple of days of driving. Rather than just driving as fast as we could, we decided to bring the trailer and made a week out of it, leaving near the end of June, with plans to see the Grand Canyon, painted desert, petrified forest, and a whole slew of other stops along the way. On our fourth day of the trip, after we'd done most of our sightseeing, we pulled over at an RV park somewhere east of Albuquerque. Now, I would like to apologize to any New Mexico residents that may read this, but we weren't exactly getting the best vibes from the state thus far. Most of the people had been friendly, but there were, like, a hundred too many stop driving drunk signs for our liking, so we weren't exactly eager to stay if possible. Our accommodations for the night were on the outskirts of a small town, the kind where the streets were all numbered and one main avenue through town had the gas station, general store, and church on it. If you've ever traveled the US, no matter what part of the country you're in, you've been through hundreds of these. We rolled in as the sun was beginning to waver and drop below the brown, dusty mountainous peaks in the distance creating a hazy light at dusk. We'd been able to establish a good routine. I got the steps and awning on the trailer set up. While Tim emptied the gray and black water tanks for lack of a better term, our used shower water and poo, respectively and replenished the clear water tanks. The campground was set up in a couple of large circles, mostly empty. There is a couple of large, 40-plus foot RVs set up on another side, and a few older couples at a fire pit in front of one of them, probably some people enjoying retirement, and a few other camping spots taken by vehicles or camps of varying sizes and elaborateness. The left side of our trailer was parallel to some thick brush and trees, so the right side the one with the door opened into the rest of the park. As I stood facing the RV, with all five four of me trying to reach and pull the awning down, I heard a hum of a motor approaching behind me. I turned to see a man on a quad bike approaching. Probably just some guy wheeling around because he's bored, I thought. I resumed work at the awning. I heard a shout behind me over the whine of the engine. You need a hand. I glanced over my shoulder and gave a half smile. No thanks, I got it. The man got off the bike anyway. He stood on the opposite end of the awning from me, reached up, and pulled, extending the cover over the porch of the trailer. Oh, thanks, I said sheepishly. He nodded. I eyed his clothing. He had a blue polo shirt, khaki shorts, and a black baseball cap on, with some sort of logo on it. He also had a belt with what appeared to be a gun. His eyes were sort of small and beady, and darted quickly around. There was a brief moment of silence as we gave each other a once-over. He squinted his eyes. I'm Marco, I work security here, he said suddenly. Oh, well thanks, 
I replied, awkwardly. This guy was definitely making my spidey senses tingle. Not in a good way. But I couldn't really figure out why. He just sort of walked away. Without saying anything else, hopped back on the bike, and left, looking back over his shoulder, and locking eyes with me for a few seconds before he left. I stood there for a minute, pondering. He's probably just kind of a socially awkward, weird dude I reassured myself. Going back to finishing up the task at hand, I felt an arm reach around my waist and grab. I jumped, letting out a sharp yelp. Sorry, I heard Tim's voice behind me. I sighed, spun around, and smiled, rolling my eyes at him. A little jumpy tonight, aren't we? He laughed, kissing me. I playfully slapped his shoulder. Come on, let's get some dinner started, I said, opening the door to the trailer. As we ate a delicious, nutritious meal of hot dogs, Easy Mac, and pickles, I told him about my newfound friend, Marco. He doesn't sound weird to me, Tim said with a mouthful of hot dog. I raised my eyebrows and laughed. Run that by me again. I giggled. He swallowed, wiping his mouth. I mean, what's so weird about him? He stared at you. I don't know, I just got the wrong vibe from him. And besides, how many RV parks have we ever stayed in that have security? He laughed. That would be none, but, to be fair, we've been saying the whole time how weird of a state this is. Besides, I doubt the owners would let some creep run around pretending to be security. He had a point. We cleaned up from dinner, got ready for bed, and were soon out cold in our separate bunks. The only light coming from the moonlight outside that lit up the gravel parking lot. Tim took the front bunk. I took the rear bunk, which was right behind the door. I awoke to the sound of the engine, the same one I heard earlier when putting the awning up. I rolled over and looked at the display of the clock on the microwave. 1.48 am. I just wanted to sleep, and a TV Magee out there was on patrol. I'm sure it's completely necessary for you to be doing that right now, I thought facetiously. I shut my eyes, but the engine persisted, coming closer and closer to our trailer. Then, suddenly, it shut off. Silence. Finally, I get back to sleep. I froze. There was a tapping at the window literally right next to my bed. If I rolled over, my face would be a few inches from the glass. I could hear a faint, low male voice from outside of the window. You need to come outside right now he kept repeating it. I rolled onto my back, slowly and peeked out of the corner of the blinds. You have to come outside. It was tough to see in the darkness, but the silhouette told me enough. It was definitely Marco, that weird security guard from before. My suspicions went from a slight weird vibe to I'm about to call the cops on this guy in the span of two seconds. Bring your husband too, it's urgent. What? I got closer to the glass. He repeated it again. You and your husband, come out, quietly, now. Before, I was convinced that this guy was some sort of rapist or something. Now I wasn't sure. He either wanted to murder both of us, or he legitimately needed us for some unfathomable reason. I still have no idea why. Maybe it was that aforementioned impeccable intuition, but I slowly stood up and crept towards the door, glancing over at Tim. He was both fast asleep and probably naked. I decided that if Marco had truly evil intentions, I could scream loud enough to wake Tim and probably anyone in a half mile radius. So I left him sleep peacefully. I silently opened the door and poked my head out. Marco stood crouched near my window and turned his head towards me. There's someone in the trailer, Marco said bluntly, in a quiet voice. What? I whispered, yeah, my boyfriend is asleep in there. I had no idea what this guy was talking about. No, there's someone else in there, he hissed urgently. In my half-asleep stupor, I still had no idea what was going on. I stepped down out of the trailer, rubbing my eye, and let the door slam behind me, causing a loud bang. Marco winced and rushed over to the door. I heard a thudding in the back of the trailer, then a shout from within. Marco rushed in, pulling the gun from his hip. I was close behind. A man was standing on the bed that I'd just been sleeping on. He was short, with dark features, a torn pair of pants, and plain black t-shirt. He had long, scraggly hair. His right arm was outstretched, holding a long knife, but he wasn't really pointing it, he just sort of held it. It was pointed sideways, with the bottom of the blade facing the ceiling. That was creepy enough, but as we stepped into the trailer, he looked our way. 
He opened and closed his mouth a couple of times, before letting out the most bizarre scream I've ever heard. It wasn't high-pitched, it was almost, like, if Kurt Cobain's drawn-out screaming and aneurysm was done by a guy that made me a serial killer, and was currently threatening my boyfriend. Oh shit, my boyfriend. I hadn't even looked at him, though it had only been a couple of seconds. He had pulled the blanket up to cover most of him and was holding a pan, which he must have grabbed off of the shelf next to his bed. Marco held up his gun, and the man took off, running to the back of the trailer, still screaming. The way he ran almost reminded me of an animal. He sort of trotted one leg at a time, leaning forward as he did, but with way more speed than you would expect. The door to the bathroom was opened, which must have been where he had hid. He proceeded through it, and in one fluid action, hopped from the seat of the toilet, to the tank, then out the back window, landing somewhere in the bushes below. Marco ran out the door, chasing him around into the woods behind the trailer. I stood in the trailer, in a state of shock, as Tim sat up, in a similar wide-eyed state. I sat on the bed slowly next to him. We were silent for what felt like forever. He exhaled loudly. Yeah, I said, I know what you mean. He smiled slowly. The rest of the night was a blur. The police came and took statements from most of the people staying at the park. The owner didn't sleep there at night. He arrived and apologized profusely, refunding our fee for the night. Marco had chased the guy for a few minutes on foot but lost him somewhere in the thicket. As far as I know, they never caught the guy, and they had never heard of any incident similar to ours to where this guy may have been. Before we left, I asked Marco how he knew the guy was in our trailer. He explained that he typically patrolled on foot and saw someone in the distance near the bushes, so he got onto his bike and made his way over to us. Around that time, he saw the guy climb into the bathroom window from the outside. That's when he woke me up at the window, trying to do so discreetly to not alert the creep that anyone knew he was in there. Both Tim and I thanked him repeatedly, but he insisted that it was just his job. The two of us were eager to get out of there, even having only slept for a couple of hours. We drove straight through to my parents' house, taking turns sleeping in the back seat of the truck while the other drove. Our perfect road trip had lost its luster, and we were ready to rid ourselves of any traces of it. Once we had arrived, before even going to my parents' house, the first thing we did was go to sell this trailer. Neither of us had any desire to keep the thing after what had happened, and frankly, I didn't think I would be camping again for a very, very long time. We pulled into the RV dealer and were able to quickly get a salesperson to talk to. After making up some reasons for wanting to sell it something about needing the money for an addition on our house, I think, we were a few signatures away from the trailer, and hopefully, the associated experience is no longer being in our possession. Now, if you can just get me the title for the trailer, that will be all that we need, the salesman said. I'll go get it while you sign these, I said to Tim, in the glove box of the truck right. He affirmed. I left the office and opened the passenger door to the truck, leaning on the seat as I popped the glove box open. It was kind of a mess, which was odd, because Tim usually kept it very organized. I rifled around it and found the document that I was looking for. As I pulled it out, a square of paper fell out and landed face down on the floor mat. I picked it up and turned it over, then my jaw dropped. It was a Polaroid photo, dated the night it had happened, taken of me asleep in bed.